The debt ceiling, are we going to get through it without a credit event? Uh, the honest answer, we don't know yet. Uh, they may get uh, to the last hour before there's an agreement, or it's possible they don't reach an agreement. If that doesn't happen, then the market is going to crash, and that may force an agreement in the next few days. D does that erode the credibility of the U.S., of the dollar, and, and American financial markets? Well, there is a lot of talk these days about uh, de-dollarization. The Chinese definitely want to increase the role of the RMB. If the U.S. were to have a real problem with debt, with a credit event and so on, that's going to increase the likelihood that, that people are going to diversify over time away from dollar assets. That's a possibility, of course. Nurul, there's so many stories here about, uh, of course, you know, big Wall Street titans arriving here and waiting for three, four hours to get an audience with the Sovereign Wealth Fund and other decision makers. Is this region going to dominate economically for the next decade? Well, certainly we've had recently an energy boom. Is going to stay here even if there has been a correction of uh, energy prices. And therefore, these countries are building up massive uh, reserves, assets that they have to deploy. And therefore, every asset manager in the world or banker is here because there are lots of no. opportunities of investing within the region, but also outside the region as well. And, and we hear, of course, about you know, diversification, wanting to get into other asset classes. Where does this Middle Eastern money, what does it change? Is it private markets? Is it other parts of the market? Is it credit? Uh, probably private markets, you know, public equities have been maybe somehow overvalued. There are still opportunities in private markets. There's lots of technological innovation. Everybody, of course, is talking about AI, machine learning, uh, quantum uh, computing, robotic automation. The future is still in technology. There are lots of people are raising money, and therefore investors in the region want to be part of that upside as well. And so are you expecting more deals coming from the Middle East and also the U.S.? I can't really quite figure out what the relationship with Middle Eastern money and U.S. finances right now. Well, there was just an announcement that, uh, for example, the QIA has invested a few hundred million dollars in a new AI firm. But those types of deals are going to continue to occur. Those are mostly in private market. Most of these new firms, of course, are not having yet an IPO. So we're going to see much more of interest by essentially investors in this region into high tech. And a lot of the new developments are occurring in the United States, I would say, more so than in uh, Europe. What are you most worried about in the markets? Is it liquidity? Is it fragmentation geopolitically that actually filters through, you know, and, and we could have like a, a shock or something quite violent on the markets? Uh, certainly there is a geopolitical depression. There is a hot war uh, in Ukraine. Unfortunately, this uh, brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine is going to get worse this year. That can lead to a, an escalation. I was just in Israel where they're worried about Israel, Iran becoming a threshold nuclear state. They'll have to make a tough decision on whether to accept deterrence or attack Iran. If that were to happen, there'd be a shock to energy prices. And unfortunately, after the G7 Hiroshima summit, I would say there's not going to be any thaw between U.S. and China. The Chinese reaction to this G7 summit is that European U.S. and Japan and others are ganging up against China. So this cold war between U.S. and China is going to get colder. And eventually, this geopolitical tensions are going to have some market ref implications because they're going to slow down economic growth, they're going to lead to rising commodity prices, and therefore they're going to continue to disturb markets and economies. But is there a role for Europe actually between the U.S. and China, and can, can they attract investments from certain parts of Asia because of this new Cold War? Uh, well, the Europeans would like ideally to do business both with the U.S. and China. The U.S. is telling them, given what's happening in Ukraine, given that China effectively is an ally of Russia, you have to take a stance. And there has been a movement. NATO is now projecting towards Asia. There is a Quad. There is a U.S. There's a whole build-up of a new Asian regional security. This is going to involve also Europe. Europe is also concerned in part no. about what's happening in China. And the G7 communique has reflected those types of concerns. Nuriel, where do you see the most complacency? I think uh, still, uh, you know, in equity markets, I think th people think that central banks are done with raising rates and therefore they're going to cut rates this year. I think that's highly unlikely. Even the FMC might raise rates further in June. Certainly the ECB is not done. And there's still a lot of inflation around the world. I think the big surprise this year is going to be the inflation is not going to fall as much as central banks expect. And therefore central banks will have to make a tough choice of either raising rates more with risk of a hard landing and financial instability or not raising rates, but then you're going to have a de-anchoring of inflation and inflation expectation. That's the complacency of the market. Yeah, but all of the warnings that we heard from chief economists, from chief executives, just haven't come to fruition about how, how we could see, you know, an economy that really falls because of inflation and more cuts. So why this dichotomy? 
Uh, there is a dichotomy because uh, I think markets believe that uh, inflation is peaked and is going to fall sharply. There may be a short and shallow recession is going to lead them to cut interest rates. So the markets are quite bullish about the short and shallow recession or even a soft landing and the recovery of the markets. I think central banks are telling them, no, we're not done yet. We're not going to cut rate this year. And there's even a risk of a correction of the economy. Even the staff of the Fed is expecting a recession later this year. How much do you worry about the UK out of the G7 countries? Is it the one that that, that could be more problematic? Well, you know, there has been a self-inflicted goal in the UK with the Brexit decision that has led to even more of an economic downturn in the UK compared to Europe and an even more pressure upward to inflation. Therefore, I would say among the G7, the UK remains the, the weakest link so far. Is there anything that they can do now, prescription, to actually get back on track, so to, to foster growth and get back in the game? Well, you know, effectively, uh, you'll have to somehow de facto reverse Brexit uh, while not doing it the formal way. Well, that's impossible. So Brexit in name only. Uh, well, if you reach uh, further trade agreements with Europe, if you maintain trade relationship, then the bottlenecks in the UK come both on the good sides, labor markets and services by the Brexit decision. So anything goes in the other direction is going to be helpful for the United Kingdom. I mean, could the UK foster more relationships with Asia and, and the Middle East in terms of trade and investment? Oh, they can, but uh, the key trading partners for the UK is still Europe and the Eurozone. So, of course, uh, at the G7 summit, there will be a greater relationship between the UK and, for example, Japan on some of the technologies and so on. They're interested in the Middle East as well. But I would say the UK has to maintain a strong and open relationship with Europe. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult economically. Nuria, is your base case some kind of credit crunch in the US? Given well, what we're seeing. well, there will be certainly some credit crunch, especially among the regional banks. Those are the ones that are squeezed. Uh, we know those are the banks that lend a lot to households, to small businesses and medium-sized enterprises, and in the commercial real estate. And the estimates as of now is that that credit crunch is going to reduce economic growth in the U.S. by at least 50 basis points. That doesn't look like a lot, but in the first quarter, U.S. growth was barely 1%. If it goes from 1% to half a percent, then you are effectively already in a growth recession. And if there are other headwinds for the global economy, you could see in the second half of the year an outright economic contraction in the United States, but also in Europe. Uh, when, does, when do markets start noticing who, who the possible next you know, president of the U.S. is? Uh, we're in an election cycle. Well, we're in an election cycle. I think that markets are not going to uh, know about it. Nobody's going to know about it. But it's going to become an element that's going to lead to more policy and political uncertainty over time, no, especially on foreign policy.